Hi, uh, Eduardo. Um, yeah, so I was here five years ago before the COVID uh, in 2018, so it's great to be back. Um, so today I'll talk about uh, flat band and wild physics in ferromagnetic Hagoma lattices. So this is an experimental talk. So I'm talking about experimental results. And um, this is the long list of acknowledgments of people who are involved in the large scheme of this collaboration. It doesn't mean that all of these people's work are presented during this particular uh, talk. It's just talking about the vast number of people who are contributing to this uh, exciting research. But the people who are highlighted here, um, where you see them in bold, those are the people whose um, you know, contributions were uh, directly related to, to the talk that I'm presenting uh, today, uh, who, who are you know, important uh, contributors uh, to the experimental results. Now, um, the outline of my talk will be, first I'll talk about the Kagome lattice, how is it a great platform to study flat band physics and uh, wild fermions. And uh, interestingly, you know, I'll show you today a lot of things that are related to the workshop of this um, meeting, which is, you know, trying to look at uh, strong electron correlated materials, which I'll show you is the case for this uh, system that I'm talking about. Also, inhomogeneities that we observe in the system, but these are not due to extrinsic factors, but you know, they are intrinsic uh, inhomogeneities where two phases coexist and they form. And, and then they can form, you know, it, the inhomogeneity can form in different regions depending on the cycle of the, uh, of the experiment. So let's say you warm up the sample, you cool down the sample, you'll see inhomogeneities, but they're not pinned by disorder because they're, they're intrinsic. And then frustration, which comes uh, from a Kagome lattice, and then topology, you know, for example, like the wild nose, which are topologically protected uh, states. So all of those components are in this talk, and I will particularly focus on ion 3 tin 2 uh, which has uh, wild nose based on DFT, and then how those can be switched by magnetization due to the strong coupling of the band structure with the magnetization. And this is a software magnet where it's easy to uh, switch the magnetization using an external magnetic field, which, which can be very modest, you know, less than one Tesla, so you can achieve it within your own laboratory. Also, I'll demonstrate how the band structure um, can be tuned with magnetization, where we experimentally observe, uh, based on the whole effect, that the band structure is different depending on whether the magnetization is polarized perpendicular to the Kagome plane or parallel to the Kagome plane. And then probably the most uh, exciting result is is the last thing that I'll talk about. I, I really hope I have the time to go there. So it's about these anomalous quasi-particles that we, um, we discovered using uh, micro-focused uh, laser ARPES. Um, so we see these bands that cannot be explained by uh, DFT calculations. They show up. And we think that it's uh, many-body physics uh, arising due to strong correlation. So, um, so there's this uh, uh, classic uh, strange metal paradigm, which uh, was, you know, described many, many times. You know, people in strongly correlated electron systems have thought about it, you know, a lot. Where if you have localized and itinerant degrees of freedom that are interacting with each other, then you can create something new that arises from this. Uh, you know, hybridization of these two different degrees of freedom. And so you can think about flat bands and dispersive bands interacting with each other, and then somehow a new phenomena emerging out of that. And so here's like a typical Hamiltonian that it kind of, you know, conceptualizes that where you have the C, you know, elements there, which are for the um, dispersive bands, and then the D, which are for the localized bands. And then you have, you know, strong correlation U, there in the Hamiltonian, and then you have something that makes those uh, strongly correlated, elect uh, I mean, the localized electrons in the D bands and the dispersive electrons in the, in the C bands interact with each other through some kind of uh, um, potential. So in that case, uh, y you can imagine sch schematically having such a flat band. Uh, in our case, we have it above the Fermi level. 
uh, based on DFT calculations, and then you have a dispersive band, but then strangely enough, you can uh, create some new band out of this um, to two bands that are predicted by DFT, uh, where you know, initially you can think that all that happens is hybridization, but besides hybridization, we have something new, like a new band uh, being created. So th that will be in the last part of my talk. Um, now, so, so far, most of the studies of flat bands have been in those coming from localized, you know, atomic uh, physics, so let's say in heavy electron systems like F bands and so on. But in this talk, I'll talk you I'll tell you about another route, which is through the geometric frustration. So instead of having heavy electrons uh, coming from F electrons, we have D electrons coming from the transition metal atoms. In this case, it's iron. And then you can have geometric frustration that leads to uh, flat band. So you can have geometric frustration both in the magnets, in the spin excitations, but also in the electronic uh, quasiparticles. So in the case of the spin excitation, so you have uh, this uh, Kagome lattice. Um, so this, these are the triangles of the Kagome lattice. And then you can think about spins residing um, at these uh, points. And then there you can have um, local excitations where it's conv confined uh, to, to, to that, you know, uh, sort of like a honeycomb uh, enclosure. So, so there are these expectations of having flat magnon bands in these uh, Kagome systems, in, in case you can describe it as a 2D system where um, you know, you're not coupling to um, other layers uh, in the 3D, because even though you have these Kagome lattices, in reality, even though it's, it's a 2D Kagome lattice, but they are embedded in a 3D crystal, and so then if you have too much talk along the C-axis, then this importance of the 2D Kagome lattice diminishes, and then the dynamics and everything is governed by other things. And so this uh, search for these uh, flat bands and the Dirac-like, uh, yeah, Dirac uh, point here does not uh, exist in the real material. So, so it's, it's pretty hard to find those idealized Kagome systems in, in a 3D material. But in any case, nevertheless, for conceptual purposes and you know, motivation, people have thought about this uh, 2D systems uh, in uh, having a Kagome lattice, and then you can have um, spin excitations that are confined uh, within this uh, honeycomb, and then you have an optical flat band. But besides that being in spin excitations, you can also have it in electronic uh, um, excitations, you know, quasiparticles, and then you can realize a flat band like this uh, due to a geometric confinement where the electrons are not localized to the atomic orbit, like the in the F electrons, but they are localized to a larger uh, region in, in, in the lattice, um, and then due to this interference of the uh, hopping amplitudes, you can actually confine it to this kind of uh, area, and so that leads to a flat band because it, it's a localized uh, mode. So, so here, the word frustration is uh, highlighted to see that, okay, we have frustration. Now, the electronic properties of Kagome lattices is very interesting. So as I said, that they can lead to flat bands, and then there have been uh, quite a you know, few uh, theoretical papers, not just this one, but there were two more published in the same issue. But the only reason why I'm highlighting this particular one is because they did talk about the Kagome lattice, whereas in some of the other papers they talked about square lattices and other geometries. But nevertheless, the, the physics that they all were talking about is that, okay, if you have flat bands with a strong U, then you may be able to uh, host in those uh, flat bands fractional quantum Hall effect at room temperature. So it's a very exciting uh, proposition, and then, of course, then there should be some experimental search for those uh, things, which so far has not been realized. Um, the other thing that happens uh, in these Kagome systems uh, predicted by simple tight binding models, so where you are not thinking about you know, any other lattice than the 2D one, you're not talking about talking and hopping along the C direction, but mainly in the uh, Kagome plane. So with that, they can, you can also host Dirac fermions, as I said before. But this only happens in, in very uh, simple type binding model. What happens in reality when you do DFT calculations is that the bands are not simple like this. 
you know, there has been no um, experimental demonstration of a real 3D material uh, having these uh, Kagome planes, you know, showing a simple band structure like this one. Um, the other thing that happens in these uh, Kagome systems, and this is not that it was predicted, but uh, experimentally it has been observed that they host wild notes. So lots of the uh, materials that uh, host wild notes, so I have listed here, uh, AFM means they're anti-fermagnetically order, uh, uh, FM means they're fermagnetic order, um, so you have different uh, systems with the Kagome lattice, and all of this have uh, been predicted to host wild nodes based on DFT calculations. So the one that we are uh, focusing on in is on this thing. So it, it's a very exciting uh, lattice system to study, uh, and because of not having been able to show all these things that are predicted, is is worth uh, doing these experimental searches. So so the material that we decided to look at is this iron 3 tn 2 uh, It's in the same space group as the one that was uh, mentioned in the earlier morning talk, um, R3 uh, bar M. So it has only a threefold uh, rotational symmetry. It has also inversion symmetry. And the, the realization of wild nose is due to the uh, breaking of the time reversal symmetry. So this is sort of like a schema schematic drawing where um, here the uh, red atoms are the tin, and then the blue atoms are the uh, iron, which form the Kagome lattice. And then at the center of that hon honeycomb, uh, you have a tin atom, so, so that's why they're on the same layer. But then besides being, uh, be being a Kagome layer, they're uh, bilayer Kagome, so that means that you have not just a single layer, but you have uh, a second layer. And we have discovered recently, you know, we, there are some suggestions that Th these bilayers are talking pretty strong to each other. So they're not decoupled from each other because the bond length is pretty short between the bilayers. Um, so one of the first things that we did on, on this material was to try to understand the spin reorientation transition. So I did mention SRT in the previous uh, view graph where I, I uh, listed a couple of uh, the different uh, wild materials based on Kagome. And this one particularly uh, we found um, magnetically interesting because it has a spin reorientation transition. And, and the first thing that we wanted to understand is what was the nature of the spin reorientation, whether it's first order or second order. And then what we found out is that it's a first order spin, uh, uh, spin reorientation transition where um, at high temperatures you have the C axis, uh, easy Easy, easy axis, and then at low temperatures, the AB plane is the axis, and then a transition happens around 120 Kelvin. And you can see that both through magnetometry, but also through uh, imaging. So you can see that the magnetic domain structure changes drastically from the you know, uniaxial, you know, C-axis, ferromagnet type of labyrinth uh, domain structure to the one where it's in the plane. You know, here it's very hard to see the magnetic domains because MFM, which is the technique used for this uh, imaging is uh, particularly uh, sensitive to you know, gradient in the z direction. And if your magnetic moment is in the plane, then nothing is sensed uh, when it goes over the domain. It only senses when you go over the domain wall, where it's only then where you have uh, magnetization uh, vector field coming out of the, the, the sample. And then we discovered by using other techniques that the magnetic domains are pretty large at this temperature. So, so that's why it's hard to capture the magnetic domain walls here. But in any case, uh, you can see that it's totally different from what happens at the high temperature phase. And then one important thing here that we, we were puzzled about and then we finally concluded was, okay, so where does the in-plane uh, domain start, you know, nucleating if you start, let's say, from the high temperature phase? And then what we discover is that they start nucleating at these needles, you know, at the end of the needles, and then they propagate to the middle of it, forming a core, so like this uh, uh, gold regions are the ones where the in-plane domain is... Uh, has nucleated and then formed like a continuous uh, uh, phase. And then this other one in the opposite uh, C-axis uh, magnetization um, domain, you have the other in-plane uh, nucleated. So if the, the two magnetization you know, directions have a different electronic structure, that means that you have now uh, one electronic structure running through this uh, gold region and then another one through the rest of the domain and then the same thing in the other region. So you have 
uh, electronic uh, coexistence of two different electronic bands, the C-axis band and the AB plane band, in the same material, and it's not due to something like chemical, you know, inhomogeneity, you know, strain inhomogeneity, nothing like that, because this domain structure will form in a different way, you know, if you have warmed up the sample and then cool it down. Uh, and so it, it's just, you know, a, dy a dynamic thing where, you know, you have different uh, electronic structures forming uh, depending on the cycle. This one? Well, anywhere? No, no, it's it's a it's a it, it, it's a stable state. So it's the domain pattern formation that happens when you have a C-axis. To try to minimize the magnetostatic energy, it has to form oppositely polarized domains, and then it it, it finds one that is uh, low in energy. But there are many equivalent you know domain patterns that can be similar in energy. So you warm up the sample, and then it will choose another one when you cool it down. Yeah. Um, now, the other thing that we did on this system is to employ x-rays. So one great thing of uh, being a Paul Sharon Institute is that you have all these colleagues that are experts in uh, x-ray uh, techniques, and then the machine is right there. So, so we looked at this uh, material from an uh, x-ray, uh, using an x-ray tool, where one of the advantages of measuring the magnetization or magnetic moment using x-rays is that you can separate the orbital and the spin contributions the, to the magnetic moment. So if you put this sample that's in a magnetometer, you can measure the magnetization you know, beautifully with a squid magnetometer, but you have no idea how much is my electronic, uh, my uh, orbital contribution to the magnetic moment versus the spin contribution. Whereas by doing this, uh, there's something called um, circular magnetic dichroism, where um, so if you have a sample, you know, that has a magnetic moment, and then you probe the X-ray absorption around the resonance uh, energies of the L3, and this is the L3, and then, then the L2 transitions, where it's from, let's say, a core level to, to the partially occupied D level, near the Fermi level, then uh, the absorption uh, coefficient is different depending on whether the moments are parallel to the to the photon helicity or anti-parallel to the photon helicity. Now, these uh, measurements uh, were done on, on a single magnetic domain, but also you can uh, achieve the same result by applying an external magnetic field and then uh, magnetizing the, the sample in a particular uh, direction, so in a, in, a, in a particular magnetization configuration, and then uh, shine the sample with an X-ray with, let's say, um, circularly left helicity and then circularly right helicity, and then measure the absorption spectrum twice, you know, w w one with each uh, helicity. And then the absorption spectrum is different. So depending on whether the helicity is, is parallel to the magnetization of the sample or, or opposite. And so you have that difference, and then there's something called the sum rule. So, so here, for example, this is our experiment, the, the black lines. So you have the black solid line and then the dashed line. So is for the different helicities, so C minus and C plus. Uh, you see that the absorption coefficient is different. Now, if you look at the other edge, the, the strength of the absorption coefficient has reversed. So if this one was strongest for, for let's say, C minus on this side, um, on the uh, different edge, is, is the weaker absorption coefficient. So you have uh, this difference, and then there's a well-established uh, sum rule that uh, by integrating this in you know, difference in the intensities, you can extract what is the orbital versus the spin uh, moment. And in our case, what we found out is that actually the orbital contribution to the total spin is pretty, I mean, to the total moment is pretty large. So the ratio between the orbital and the spin uh, moment is 0 0.22, whereas in pure iron, so let's say a chunk of pure element iron, it, the orbital contribution is pretty small. It's only 0 .0 0 uh, 0.04, uh, respect to, to, to the spin. So having a large orbital moment then also, you know, can indicate that you can have uh, large spin orbit coupling effects in this system. Now, I said that the band structure is different depending on the polarization of the system. So 
Uh, this is a DFT calculation um, where they incorporated U and, and also um, spin orbit coupling. So it shows, depending on where the moment is pointing, whether it's pointing out of the plane or in the plane in two different perpendicular directions, the band structure is different. It's a little bit hard to see how different it is, but if you focus on places, you know, here and so on, you can see that there are differences. You know, you can see differences here and so on. And uh, then this leads to the situation where, because the band structure is different, then the wild cones that form in this system are different depending on the magnetization. Um, so this system has a very complex band structure. So if you see, it's just, you know, I don't know how to make this thing, how to make out of this, this uh, complicated band structure. So that's why these uh, DFT collaborators could not even tell me, well, you know, I asked them, can you calculate what's the density of states uh, at the Fermi level for, let's say, you know, sample polarized out of the plane versus in the plane, because that's one experiment that we did. And then they, they couldn't. They say, that, you know, you have open uh, Fermi surfaces. It's just impossible to integrate this. Hmm? Oh, sure, yes. <laughs> So it's a very they they told me it was very difficult. That's what I was told, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, so then they um they did this uh uh, search for the wild nodes, and then they found wild nodes, and lots of them close to the Fermi surface uh, within 10 MeV. You know, th there have been reports of maybe wild nodes, you know, in other materials, but in many cases, if the wild nodes uh, reside very far away from the Fermi level, they have not meaningful uh, impact on the electronic transport properties. So in, in our case, uh, we see them independent of where the magnetization is pointing, a lot of them close to the Fermi level. And this shows, for example, depending on where the magnetization is pointing, you can have a wild node forming. So um, let's say there's a wild node here. If the magnetization was pointing in the y direction, a particular you know, location uh, in the brilliant zone. But if you rotate the magnetization, which is easy to do, um, the, the gap opens up, so that means that the wild node disappears. So you can control the wild nodes in this system using an external magnetic field. So can we detect that, that we are actually changing the band structure via magnetization? And the answer is yes. So we did um, Hall effect measurements. So this is just uh, the ordinary Hall effect. Of course, there's the anomalous Hall effect in this material also because of the ferromagnetism and also the presence of very curvature around the wild nodes and so on. But um, for this particular uh, study, the focus was on the ordinary Hall effect, just to see whether the care density is changing uh, and is monitored by the Hall effect. So what we did was basically you apply the magnetic field out of the plane and then rotate the magnetic field you know, through a, uh, you know, 360 degrees and then see whether the Hall effect uh, reflects anything that indicates that the band structure is changing, and the answer is yes. So if you look at um, high temperature, so let's say room temperature, and then you measure the Hall effect as a function of the angle of the magnetic field, then it just follows a cosine theta dependence, which means that probably the band structure is, is you know, staying the same. It, not much is going on, uh, or at least you know, the Hall effect cannot monitor the, the change of the band structure, basically the projection of the uh, magnetic, magnetic field to the, you know, direction, to, the, um, to the orthogonal direction is getting reduced as you rotate the, the thing. So it's basically, even though the total vector of the, of the H field is constant, the projection in the Z direction is cosine theta uh, dependent. And that's why then um, uh, it's you have this uh, sinusoidal, um, sinusoidal uh, dependence of the Hall effect. But if you go to low temperature, you see that that sinusoidal dependence actually um, is broken. So for example, you see here at the lowest temperature is no longer sinusoidal. You have like maxima at uh, angles that are not um, 
zero, uh, which is uh, parallel to the c-axis. So, so that uh, description is, is broken. And so we did fits to the Hall effect uh, curves, you know, rho x, y versus h at uh, different angles. And then from that, we were able to extract uh, what is the carrier density. And I don't want to dwell onto this. Uh, but basically, then, by, by doing that, then you can see that um, at 2 Kelvin, depending on where the magnetization is pointing, the Hall effect that we measure is different. So there's a modulation of uh, a factor of 4 uh, between out of the plane and then in the plane. So that, that's a large uh, modulation. And if you think about metals being hard to modulate the carrier density, this is, um, you know, quite, quite, you know, it's not something like, you know, the semiconductor transistors, but, you know, it's an interesting thing that you can actually m modulate the carrier density in a metal. Now, how about the electronic structure uh, probed by uh, ARPES? Now, when we first uh, probed it, uh, we saw something that looks like uh, six-fold symmetry. So this is the Fermi surface uh, probed um, using uh, synchrotron X-rays of 90 eV. This is the, the Fermi surface that is calculated using DFT. It shows a six-fold uh, Fermi surface is because um, we, we um, you know, this is the cut for k is equal zero, where you can have uh, six-fold symmetry. And at other lower symmetry uh, k z values, the Fermi surface is not supposed to be six-fold symmetry. But at this, uh, at the k z value of zero, um, you can have this uh, six-fold symmetry. And then the ARPES result sounds like it's a six-fold symmetric uh, Fermi surface, even though the, the group is uh, three-fold uh, symmetric. Now, um, I'm not going to talk about that. Let me skip this thing. Um, the other thing that we saw is, is by changing the photon energy, so you can do uh, KZ dispersions of the bands, and then we see that they're not um, KZ independent, which means that there's dispersion along KZ, which means that they're three-dimensional bands rather than uh, two-dimensional bands. So if, the, if it was uh, two-dimensional bands, then there should not be any curving. It should be all just straight lines where there's no KZ dependence. But you see that the bands uh, do curve. So they're uh, slightly uh, 3D. Now, besides using this uh, synchrotron technique, so I told you that we looked something using like 90 uh, eV. So based on that, the probe depth is uh, pretty small. It's about, you know, in the order of uh, 10 angstroms because that's the electron mean free path uh, for escape. So that means that you can only probe those that are very close to the surface. But uh, by using a laser uh, of uh, 6 eV, uh, you can actually probe to uh, deeper depths. So you can probe depths of uh, 100 angstrom, which is going to be more like the bulk-like uh, band structure. So what happens if we use that um, laser probe instead of, uh, uh, of the X-ray uh, from the synchrotron? Now, uh, first of all, the DFT calculations pre predict uh, that there should be some electron pockets near the gamma point, which is at the zone center. But also, if you look at the, the cuts here, uh, so which is the Fermi surface cuts, this is for KZ slightly off of the high symmetry point of k is equal zero, and then you can see that although you have like you know six features here, this and this feature are not the same, uh, whereas this feature and that feature is the same. So it's it's actually only threefold symmetric. And then if you look at here near the zone center, uh, you can see that suddenly this is not uh, sixfold symmetric; it's uh, threefold symmetric. So what what this uh, you know calculation says is that if you go of the k is equal, uh, equal 0, then you should see something that is threefold like rather than a sixfold like. Um, the other thing that uh, we did was we um, did uh, tune the u value to see how the band structure changes because we wanted to see what is the correct u value to um, represent our band structure measured by ARPIS. And then the band structure uh, that best represents our ARPIS data is a u value of 1.3. Um, so 
we did look at uh, band structures that we found band structures that look more like this, and so then we concluded that the U value relevant uh, is 1.3 eV. So let me, um, yeah, so I, I talked about the U dependence, how it depends, uh, how the bands depend on the U. So this is what we found uh, using uh, laser RP. So we find these uh, things, it's kind of blurry, but for these uh, materials, actually this is a pretty good, uh, uh, it's a it's a sharp <laughs> sharp uh, spectrum. Um, so this is the Fermi surface, and then this is a cut uh, through the uh, gamma endpoint, and then we see this uh, band, one band we call it alpha, and then th we see another band that we call it gamma, and then we see this uh, funny uh, thing here that uh, cuts through the Fermi surface, but then it just stops; it doesn't continue. So, so th this is uh, what we call the beta band. And it's the beta band that find we find it to be mysterious because it cannot be matched by any DFT calculation. Now, if we go to another uh, part of uh, the sample, then we, s we see this uh, Fermi surface, and then we were wondering what it is. And then what we see is that it's uh, 180 degrees uh, rotated with respect to this one. Now, because it's a three-fold symmetry crystal, if it's 180 degrees rotated, it's the same as 60 degrees rotated. So you can think of this as, as two different uh, Fermi surfaces rotated by 60 degrees. Now, being 60 degrees rotated, 180 degrees rotated is the equivalent, and then you can see it here when you do the, the cut. Uh, so basically, the, the, the spectrum is flipped with uh, respect to this uh, center, center axis. And so we mapped uh, these two regions, and then this is what we found out. So if one of the regions is called, uh, let's say, red, the other region is called green, then basically it forms a domain pattern that we think it's a crystal uh, twin domain pattern. And then it does not change even if we raise the temperature to 80 Kelvin, meaning that it's not of magnetic origin because the magnetic domain structure does change uh, when we uh, raise the temperature from 6 to 80 Kelvin. So we think that is really a, a crystal domain structure. Now, what is this uh, beta band? Um, as I said, we cannot match it through the DFT. So what we think it is is uh, something due to um, a hybridization and a new, new band formed due to um, antibody physics. So that beta band is uh, also shown here again. Um, so this is this is uh, one band that is uh, not particularly sharp, but then um, this is uh, the sharp uh, beta band. Um, it, it's uh, here, uh, uh, so sorry, this is just the alpha, alpha band, and it's here, here where you see the sharp beta band. And then this is the other band, this is the gamma band. So it's this uh, beta, beta band which is the mystery. So you see that it comes here and then it just stops. And it's also sharper than anything else. And then that beta band disappears as we warm up the sample, where the rest of the band stay. So if we look at the spectral weight of this beta band, and then we uh, also analyze the spectral weight of this gamma band, this gives us confidence that this beta band is something that arises from this gamma band. Because if you look at the spectral weight, um, so it's, uh, the colors are a little bit uh, hard to see, but the beta band is the one that is plotted here, and then is plotted at uh, two different temperatures. So one is uh, 6 Kelvin, and the other one is 25 Kelvin. And then the gamma band is plotted here. So uh, at 6 Kelvin is the blue, and then the, the other one at higher temperature is the uh, yellow one. So you see that the, there's a sharp transition. So when the beta band dies at uh, higher binding energies, that weight is picked up by the gamma band. So we think that this weight of the beta band is coming from the alpha band. So it's robbing uh, its uh, density of states from the gamma band, forming a new band. And then when this band dies, then uh, basically the spectral weight gets transferred to the gamma band. And then if you uh, sum the two spectral weights, basically there's no transition here at this uh, binding energy of like 20 MeV. So the the some of the two weights are, are conserved. So from that, there's charge conservation, but at the same time, there's fractionalization because if you think about you know, the, 
the electronic states that you're occupying here, and they're below the Fermi level, they should be fully occupied. But if you're sharing it between the two, so that means that uh, none of these two bands have their, their you know, quantum states fully occupied. So they're sharing their, their spectral weight as if you know, the uh, wave function is the superposition of the wave function at this band and at that band. I'm going to skip this due to the um, lack of time. So what we think is that, OK, so there's hybridization, but then there's something else. So you, you have this new beta band that is forming. And we think that this is a band uh, induced by the interaction. So basically, when these uh, two bands, the curvy band and the flat band, interact, so the flat band has uh, you know, strong correlations. You have you know, strong correlation effects in flat bands, and then that then leads to localization. So then you want to shrink the Fermi surface, and it can do it partially, but not completely. So you have this uh, new band uh, formed, which is a ghost band of the gamma band uh, reflected, um, reflecting the um, you know, localization effect coming from the uh, flat band. So I'm going to skip all that. and. Um, skip all of this due to the lack of time. And so basically, I showed you that you can approach flat band physics uh, without this uh, trivially highly localized orbitals in heavy you know, uh, you know, F electron systems by uh, taking advantage of geometric frustration in a triangular lattice uh, where you can form localized um, localized uh, bands, and then um, you can basically see that you know, new quasi-particles can be generated out of this, um, this interaction between the flat band and the dispersive band. Thank you. Thank you, Yunit. Uh, we have time for questions. Um, I'm a little curious about the whole number that uh, you are extracting. If I remember correctly, it changed by about a factor of two as you sweep the angle of the magnetic field. Is that correct? Uh, we, we changed by a factor of four, but what we're measuring is the difference between the electrons and the holes. So, so that's we cannot measure separately how many electrons we have and how many holes we have at the Fermi level. Basically, it's a, as you saw, the band structure is extremely complicated. The Fermi surface is very complicated. But all we can measure is the difference between the two uh, using the Hall effect. And what I'm saying is that the difference between the two, the net charge imbalance between whole electrons and holes, can be modulated by a factor of four. And is there any understanding of how that comes about? Any what? Understanding of yes, how that comes I, about? I, I think it's, it's coming from the Basically, if you have like a zero band um, zero band gap crossing, so the wild nodes, then you can have you know wild nodes and then opening of the of the gap, and so you are changing the band structure slightly, but having a big impact uh, if those things happen near the Fermi level. So I think that's what we, what's happening in the system. But I thought you had a lot of other bands and large Fermi surfaces there, and your total whole number will come from those as well. That's true. So if you're just changing the vial nodes, there's not that many states near the vial nodes. Yeah, you can, you can make um, that argument, but you can still have, I mean, experimentally, we see a strong effect. This, this is experimentally observed. Oh, I mean, it's yeah. quite interesting. Thank you. So. Uh, Thank you for the superb talk. I actually, I've never heard this before, and it's it's super interesting to me, uh, and I think to everyone. So uh, you are you're drawing the analogy to the Anderson lattice model, where we actually have localized spins and the quantum effect. So is there an analog? Can you can this be? Can we think of this as a in quantum language, where these uh, you know correlated spins interact with conduction electrons? And I'm specifically asking about the fact that the quantum lattice has a very low energy scale when this is destroyed and the new band, the quasi-particles are destroyed. So is this temperature dependence that you see, is this something that is related to the destruction of heavy quasi-particles? Can you elaborate on that? 
Well, <laughs> for that, I would say, you know, probably Shimeo is the right person to give you that answer. You know, I, I know very little about Kondo Lattice physics, but what I heard is that he looked at our work, which is in the archive, he got inspired, and then <laughs> he came up with his own, um, you know, ideas on how to think about these things. And of course, he's doing that, you know, theoretical and experimental realization in the Kondo Lattice of this same kind of idea. He's doing it in heavy fermion systems. Yeah. Rafael? Uh, I was just curious about, uh, you mentioned when you do circular dichroism, you can separate the orbital and spin contribution. Is it, is it uh, obvious? I would expect that once you have spin orbit coupling, you're just gonna look at a magnetic moment. So how, how, what is the, how, do you, how are you able to distinguish both from circular dichroism? Yeah, so in a, in a system that has no orbital magnetic moment, the circular dichroism of the two um, edges, L3 and L2, are the same and just opposite sign. But if you have a difference between the two integrated areas, then it comes from the orbit. Um, yeah, so in the case of iron, um, oops, uh, in the case of iron, so I, I, I have here blue uh, taken out of a uh, published paper. Um, you see the difference between this and this. You know, once you integrate, it's almost the same. It's just that the sign, so if the solid one is stronger than the, than the dash one, um, th this difference in, in area is the same but opposite in sign, almost the same, and that's why it's very small. Whereas in our case, there's a big discrepancy between the, the two peaks, the integrated area, and that that discrepancy is coming from the orbital. But, but, if, I have, orbital but if I have just like, a, you, know, like a, a, you know, a gap direct point, which locally is gonna have a lot of mm, magnetic, you, you can call orbital magnetic moment that is not necessarily associated to like an atomic uh, uh, limit. The, uh, my I guess my question, I, I, does this only work if I'm thinking an atomic limit where I have uh, L and S and, and the coupling between them on that single atom, or can it capture more broadly other orbital magnetism from the band structure, from topology, and so on? I, I think th this thing was first considered as an atomic orbital magnetic moment, but this is actually a question that I am posing myself you know, exactly the question that you have asked. Because we have done the same experiment for cobalt-3 tintal sulfur-2. And then there, the measured orbital moment based on this, you know, classical sum room analysis tells us there's no orbital magnetic moment. Um, on the other hand, you know, Hassan's uh, group's paper, uh, where they did STM, they claimed that they have in the flat band that they measure near the Fermi level with S S STS, uh, scanning tonic spectroscopy, it's about a diamagnetic orbital moment of minus three mu b. Whereas, but of course, they're only measuring for that band. So I have myself this question, you know, to try to understand <laughs> the difference between this orbital moment from, you know, the atomic, uh, you know, physics orbitals versus from the band, you know, what are we measuring? <laughs> well, you should be too bothered by this difference between experiment, you have an x-ray, so you have your length scale and your time scale are very different from the length scale and time scale of STM. So any dynamic fluctuation, you're gonna see different things. Don't worry about it. Right. Well, uh, I don't think any of us are seeing dynamical fluctuations, but what I'm saying is that in their case, they only measure one band, and of course, it's not just that band that makes a contribution. All the bands need to be taken into I, account. I, I know, but in general, yeah. you shouldn't compare with STM. It's just very different time scale measurement. But I have a question, actually, I have a question that would probably help you answer part of Vlad's question and also uh, uh, Raphael's question. That is, uh, you measure a transport property. Yes. Did you, uh, because I, mi I miss it, did you plot the temperature dependence of the uh, longitudinal resistivity and the transverse resistivity? or the whole coefficient. Do yes. you see Fermi liquid like behavior at low temperature or not? Uh, what for, what at behavior? low temperature, yes. did you see uh, like T square kind of resistivity or not? Uh, at low temperature we see T cube 
TQ. Uh, okay, so non thermal yeah. liquid, right? right? And so maybe then Vlad can talk with you and see whether the condo physics would ever generate TQ behavior. If the answer is no, then you can tell Vlad, no, we don't see condo physics, right? And similarly, you can, you can use that to reply to uh, 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 Ascot's question that you don't see T square behavior. Therefore, the uh, uh, Judah model doesn't apply. Therefore, this argument that we are all worried about from the Fermi surface from the large carrier does not matter because they don't even see Fermi liquid behavior. So we don't know what they're seeing, but whatever we are thinking in our brain probably doesn't quite work here. Right? I, I think you can answer those questions by simply showing the non Fermi liquid temperature dependence, and then we all shut up. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, let's thank our speaker. And our next 